Hello and welcome back to Torment Tides of Numenera. So, if you're seeing this, that makes me very happy because this is my third try at this recording. So the first time I'd gotten about 25 minutes into the recording, met people, had intrigue, discovered amazing things. Actually, it turns out that only I can prevent forest fires. And then the power went out for about 10 seconds. Took the recording with it. Fine. Stomp around the house, get everything turned back on. Sit down, fire up Torment uh, Tides of Numenera, and the power goes out again for 40 minutes this time. So, started things back up again, and here we are. So, unfortunately, I've done a lot of this. So, I'm going to go through and I'm going to do things basically exactly the same way. Um, try to stick the same way through the dialogue trees. So, alright, here we go. So, um, I've been musing a last time, the last time, a little bit about um, party size and whether or not that, you know, we should take Rin with us. So, I've been desperately trying to avoid learning anything about this game. Um, Nothing. I don't know who the companions are, because otherwise I'm going to min-max. So, um, I did a little bit of searching and came across the sentence that said something along the lines of... Smell? Speaking of what? smells, did I ever tell you... Hey, I have a freckle. I've decided I actually decide... Uh, I like him. So, um, I came across a line that said... Um, Experience is split between all human party members. Which, all by itself kind of made me do a little bit of a double take. So it sounds like each XP event, whatever, is split amongst the party. So the larger the party, the slower we're going to level. So I'm going to not get out of control, but I also don't know what the party size is. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm kind of congested today. I took some Sudafed, but even so, after watching this video, you should go wash your hands. Um, I don't know if I can kick people out, and then if I do, I don't know if I can go pick them back up. So, because I went down Calistige, and I see that we have an option here to part ways, but decided that um, I wasn't going to do that. Um, nothing in here was interesting. She doesn't care what we do the Stitcher. Um, she just doesn't care about them. So, okay. So let's talk to Rin. Hello, Rin. Again. Oh, it's you. What brings you back here? So, Rin, why don't you come with us? She looks at each of your companions in turn. I think I'd feel safer here. You sure you won't come with us? She looks at all three of your companions and back at you. Quite sure, yes. Alright, little wench. Fine, whatever. Of course. Um, I still haven't talked to our drunken master down here, so we'll chat with him at some point. Um, notice up here, ooh, look, these are carriageical drones. So that's probably the place that we worked or whatever. Anyway, so let's talk to furtive dude standing back here. Finzen. Everything about this slender young man says, Thug, from his scar-slashed eyebrow to his calloused hands hovering over his hip where a dagger would hang, but he doesn't have one. Instead, flour cakes his hands, and a single apron string hangs from his pocket. He is, apparently, a baker. A very hardcore baker. Stand still, you shine, he says, and peers over your shoulder. You follow his gaze to an armored soldier who is loitering in the public square. That levy's been following me for days. Can't even stop for a piss without checking side to side. Uh... Are you sure he's following you? Put it like this, he says. I know when I'm being followed. I've seen him on my track dawn to dark for three days. I ain't done nothing wrong. It's worse than that, he says. That's my levy. What do you mean it's my levy? I'm a citizen, he says, as if this explains it. When it becomes clear it hasn't, he groans. Every levy is made from a citizen, he says. This one was made for me. Look, I can't explain why, but I know that that one's mine. I feel it, right? And now it's coming for me. That's an interesting statement all by itself. You know, does everyone know, like, what the levy is that's made from them? Is there any connection between the levy and the original? I don't know. Very interesting. Look, he won't catch me alone, right? I gave a year of my life to make him, and I thought that was that. Now I catch him standing in the street outside the bakery, whispering to himself, playing with that carving of his. So that's the nutball guy we saw off to the side with the little burned bird thing. His teeth graze his lip as he leans closer. He even tried to talk to me. Levies aren't supposed to know where they came from, right? He ain't supposed to know who you are. He wavers, gathering his courage. Could you... Could you talk to him? Find out what he wants? Well, why don't you talk to him? He swallows hard. I've heard stories. Levies go wrong sometimes. Get obsessed with the person who gave them life. If the two ever meet, the levy goes mad. Tears him apart. That ain't going to happen to me. Not after... <clears throat> he cuts himself short. Not after all I've been through. Alright, I'll talk to him. He nods again towards the armored band standing a distance away in the public square. He's the only levy in the district, so you can't miss him. Plus, he ain't smiling like all the others, and he's holding some kind of charred wooden thing in his hands. Making a note. 
Need anything else? Um, I know how they make levies. Oh, good. Farewell. Okay, may I point out that this is a circle and not a square. Okay, fine. Anyway. Stupid English. Good to see you again, sir, the levy says, still staring across the plaza. Tears roll silently down his cheeks. So, Finzen sent me to find out why you're following him. Yes, he says, the despair melting away. In that moment, he looks like a child with a child's desperate hope. He knows too, doesn't he? He saw what we did. What we did. Tears leak from his eyes, trailing down into his mouth as he continues. When the machine ripped that year for me to make him, I felt the choices unraveling before me. He hugs himself. I see them coming. None of it can be changed. Tell him this. For me, the Gillum Manor job did happen. A servant caught him, called the levies. They chased him, and he set a fire. His eyes squeezed shut. The fire spread throughout the neighborhood. People were trapped. People screamed. His hand clenches over the charred toy bird in his palm with a soft crunch. Please tell him. Tell him that I'm with him in the dark, hiding from the mobs, sawing, sobbing. Tell him, tell him to give me a different year, a better one. Several interesting things here. This can't be a normal experience for the levies to be able to see some possible future. That's pretty wacky all by itself because yeah, he's talking about a thing that that did happen for him. Okay, that's another thing. There's a fire and he's holding onto this charred toy bird. Where did he get that? This is something I actually hadn't thought about previously. Um Unless he just happened to be poking around somewhere and found a burned bird. Did this come from his alternate future? That would be really neat. So, what kind of a year do you want from Finzen? A year without the blackened door, he says earnestly. Without the hand tangled in the grate. The weeping in the dark places. Silent tears stream down his face. He doesn't seem to be aware of him. Wails rising with the glowing ashes. My arms bound with ragged rope. Every time I'm there, in these last minutes, I try to apologize, but my mouth... His fingertips brush at his lips. My mouth is full of dirt and blood. All right, I'll go talk to him. One second. All right, back we go. Yes. To our pal, the furtive baker. Did you find out anything? He asks, his eyes darting around to check on the distant levy. I've spoken to the levy. He mentioned something about a Gillum Manor job. He what? Finzen says, going pale. Keep your voice down. You tell anyone else about this? No? Good. He lowers his voice. I have to be, uh, <clears throat> unspecific about this, understand? Before I became a citizen, I was, a, uh, well, I wasn't a nice person. I took things. For money. And just a few weeks ago, certain people told me they wanted me to rob Gillum Manor. He grimaces, rubbing his neck. I was gonna do it. But then I became a citizen. Gave up a year of my life to create the levy. That levy. Something changed, she said, frowning. All of a sudden, I couldn't get the dangers out of my head. How thick the levy patrols were like, or how the captain herself was looking into, um, one of my older adventures. He plays with the apron strings hanging from his pocket. So I canceled the job and started working at my aunt's bakery. Never did the Gillum job, and that's the truth. So I wonder if the machines split them. If it split them into a version that did the job, and then this split him into the version that didn't do the job. Didn't think about this very carefully. Okay. So the levy's seeing what happened if you did the job. He wants another year from you. Updated my journal. Oh, I get it, he says, rolling his eyes. It's a shakedown. Give me a year or I tell them what you did. Well, I ain't done anything. I never killed anyone, and I don't owe him nothing. I can't keep handing out years like they're free. Um. I don't remember what I said last time. You know, that's not fair. He's suffering for what you would have done. I ain't never been in the same town as fair, he says, shaking his head. You ever find it, you let me know. Crap, that was the wrong choice. Making a note. I'd go up to Government Square and tell the captain of levies what he's up to. Well, if I had any way of explaining it. Hey, your levy's following me around. I think it's because he's haunted by my criminal past. Um, and I went with persuasion. So, dude, seriously, give the levy another year of your life. He started fresh. You should get the same chance. I went with this because, um, even though it's a copy more or less, you know, it's a thinking thing, so I'm concerned about that. Okay, and I rolled a 90%, right? Yes. Be good. 
Oh, for what? He says, exasperated. A couple bad dreams? I didn't do anything. He subsides, crossing his arms as if he's cold. All right. What did he see in this other future? I get caught? Chased around, maybe? You, uh, mm, accidentally hurt some people. Hurt, he says, forehead crinkling. Hurt bad? He sees some of the truth in your eyes and sighs. Yeah. Making a note. Fine. Fine. But I ain't running myself down searching for a way to give my life away. He rubs his eyes. The levy machine's at the order of truth. Go talk to the scholars. They're so hungry for this. Maybe they could bash something together that'll rip another year from me and give it to him. He grins, but his heart is definitely not in it. Good luck. So, um... Oh, I had a thing I was going to say, and I've totally forgotten it. Um, Levy's thing... Well, okay, it'll come back to me. So, let's head on up here. Yeah, I am going to min-max my group just a little bit once I get things figured out, because I have a tank, a rogue, and then I have two casters. So, I'm not totally sure that I need both. So, we'll go ahead and um, see if we can ditch Calistige at some point. But I just, I don't know, I'm worried about messing with it. So, come over here, let's talk to this drone. By the way, Chirurgical is supposed to have two R's in it, but... This small mechanical Chirurgical... Chirurgen? Chirurgen is roughly the size of your head. At one end of its arms, a trio of slender, razor-sharp blades flick at the air. It's not clear whether it's trying to sense you or warning you to keep your distance. Let's poke at it. The drone buzzes a warning at you as you lean in for a closer look. The retractable blades leap to your attention. A tiny shaft of light graces the edge of each one, and they taste the air like tiny tongues. But you also notice a panel beneath the blades, fluttering like an insect's wing. Beneath, you catch a glimpse of a row of saw-toothed injectors. You notice you're tapping a finger against your leg, and it takes you a moment to realize why. A steady, gentle, soundless ripple is breaking against you like waves on a shore. This drone appears to have a heartbeat. Interesting. So we've got a neat collection of books back here. The books jamming the shelves of this desk are divided equally between obscure medical text and mechanical know-how manuals. It's bugging me that I can't find that book that I apparently checked out. The shelves abound with beakers, flasks, and other myriad containers. The utter lack of labels on any of them is somewhat worrying. Ooh, I like this. The shape of this operating table provides little information regarding the physiology of the beings it was originally designed to treat. Ugh. Okay, so... Let's step out of the way here, because I can't click on the guy we're supposed to talk to. Jerina! This old man's skin is covered in makeup, painstakingly drawn to resemble dark stone. His eyes widen briefly as he notices you, and his face and neck harden into actual obsidian for a moment. Then he smiles and nods at you, his features mobile once more. Welcome, welcome, he says. Sorry about the stone. Polymorphic flesh modification, you see. <laughs> no, I don't see. I didn't see you walk up, and I assumed you were going to cut my throat and take my chirurgical parlor for yourself. Why would you think such a thing? I do good business here, the old man shrugs. If I were a younger man looking to make a name for myself in this city, I'd kill me too. Hmm. My chirurgical parlor is a marvel of the prior world, you see. Just pick an item or a service, pay my outrageous fees, and after a short to long period of fairly safe but indescribable agony, you walk away with some horrible Numenera bits whirring away inside you. He pokes a few buttons on a device strapped to his wrist, and lights twinkle across its length. A dark glassy lens focuses on you. Ah, uh, well, um, <clears throat> so, uh, how did you come to own this parlor? It was originally a partnership, he said. My colleagues and I spent two years digging it out, getting the whole mess working. He sighs. Of course, we had to test the drones before we tried them out on anyone else. Customers getting skinned alive on opening day is bad for business. Turns out that was a wise move. Gorna chose an intelligence modification, and the drones cut off his head to work on it more directly. Mm. Myra picked strength, and the drones sliced off her arms. They defaulted to sever in those days. He smiles fondly. Anyway, six partners later, I was the sole proprietor. Worked out the kinks, and here we are with no fatalities in... Uh... Months. No fatalities in months. Well, let's see what your items and services consist of. Of course, he says, tapping a few buttons on the broad device and circling his wrist. The lens beams a cone of light directly into your eye, which immediately begins watering. Blinking, you see a menu of items severely hanging in the air. Seemingly hanging in the air. So, clawed gauntlets, huh? I knew that would catch your eye, he says, digging you in the ribs. We plant long hollow rods in your forearms with steel blades sheathed inside. Just flick your wrist and out they pop, surprising anyone who mistook you for unarmed. 
he demonstrates within his unoccupied risk, making little shh sounds. 125 shins, so you get to become Wolverine. Nah. So what is the jagged memory? This, he says with a smiled finger, is a tricky one. It's a mesh that fuses through your skin, leaving jagged marks like tattoos. When you attack, you'll always hit your enemy's old wounds, even if, well, even if they weren't there before. Told you it was a tricky one. I love temporal manipulation. Let's continue down the list. The Encroaching Darkness. A beguiling name, isn't it? He says, his laugh lines crinkling. I'm glad you like it because, uh, I'm not really sure what it does. It's a living creature, you see, that crawls around inside your body while you sleep. Eventually it takes root in your nervous system and does, uh, something. Could be good, could be bad, could be both. It certainly won't be boring. Uh, that makes me nervous. So what are the blood nanites? Oh, it's quite simple, he says. The drones fill your blood with millions of tiny machines that promptly begin devouring you alive until they learn to differentiate between your body and anything that's not supposed to be there. After that, they'll do their level best to purge toxins and illnesses from your body with every pump in your heart. He pauses. In case I wasn't clear, this one is really going to hurt. Pay in advance, please. Yeah, cute. Let's see here. The Numenera Analyzer sounds safest? It's quite safe, he says, nodding. Well, most of the time, in three out of five cases. And the procedure couldn't be simpler. The drones simply saw your skull open, shove an implant into the right spot, and seal everything back up again. Once they do that, the implant will help you identify the purposes of unknown Numenera. Let's keep reading down this. An artificial eyeball, huh? Really? Oh, a very popular item, he says, nodding. The meat ones wear out so easily. This one never does, and it'll help you spot things normalized miss. All it takes is a one-time cost of 110 shins and a tremendously unpleasant operation. So, as far as I know, I can just start, like, upgrading. And that's exciting. I like upgrades. So... I don't know if I can do them all, if I can only do some, if I can do one. Um, and, uh... Um... I don't know what kind of negative effects they'll have, because of course they'll have one. So, Claude Gauntlets, eh, I'm not doing melee. Jagged Memory, interesting. I like time manipulation, but once again, I don't intend to be punching things. Encroaching Darkness, mystery creature attaching to my nervous system. Uh, I'm going to pass on that for the moment. If there's a lot of popular demand, maybe I'll come poke at it. Blood Nanites, sound useful. Um, I'll think about that. Numenera Analyzer is going to be probably a gimme. Um, because there's no way either I or in my RP thing here are going to pass up the chance to figure out what new machines do, of course. Um, the artificial eyeball sounds kind of cool because I'm also trying to, um, be perceptive and so on and so forth. So, this is right about when the power went out. So, when I was kind of waffling here and talking back and forth. So... Well, fortune favors the bold, as our new friend Eratus would agree. So let's, uh, get to the uh, Numenera Analyzer. Can't get into your brain otherwise, he says. And they rarely cut the wrong parts off. 95 shins. Oh, dear God. I'll take it. The drone's metallic arms pin you in place, and you hear a circular saw spinning faster. Well, you can't claim, drone, I didn't warn you. The blade clips through your skull in a heartbeat and pinchers pry open the loose cap. Ugh. You're distantly aware of struggling against the drone's unyielding arms before a metal spine jams itself into your brain. Everything goes white. Ugh. After mending your breech skull, the machines release you. You stagger, but keep your feet as the implant begins humming. Swirls of text streak past your vision as the thing comes to life. Interesting little thing, isn't it? Jeranoff says. It does get, uh, puzzled by larger Numenera, but it should be able to help most smaller things you scatter around with. Alright, so I gained Numenera Analyzer. Neat! Okay, I wonder if I can, like, do all of these. Oh my gosh, that would be great. 5% on machinery, mystery, and natural tasks. Oh, this is great. Whispering directly into your mind in the voice of a somewhat befuddled gentleman of advanced years, this implant bestows upon its user the arcane and obscure knowledge from a mental copy of a long-gone nano. Often, this knowledge is indecipherable and confusing, but at other times it's useful. Oh, this is so cool. Um... Oh, I really want to poke at the eye, but we'll stop for right now. That's 
That's probably enough. Okay, so... Have we been over here? I don't think so. What's this? The salty air only partially mutes the cloud of putrid sweetness clinging to this jumble of fallen wood, stone, and iron. Until recently, this was someone's home, but the unstable ground must have caused it to collapse. You shift aside broken pieces of furniture and small pieces of rubble, but you find nothing of value. After a short while, you realize what has happened. Someone has already picked through the ruins and taken the more accessible valuables. You stand back, concentrating. Nothing about this pile of stone is familiar, but the view from where the door once stood, a boundless horizon falling into the sea, is... This appears to be the house where the castoff once lived, but either he left no clues of his identity, or, well, they were taken by scavengers. It might be helpful to ask around the area and see if some he's found and spotted looting his house. Um, I wonder if this was, uh, the girl we were just talking to. So, we'll come back here. We haven't talked to these people up here, have we? I don't believe so. Have we talked to Pico? The name sounds familiar. Oh, no, okay. Pico. The mutant boy gazes at the entrance to the chirurgical parlor, flinching at each scratch of razor metal on metal from within. By your estimation, he's in his late teens, but is the size of a young, malnourished child. His arms are little more than bone, wrapped in red speckled skin, and a raw line zigzags down between his mismatched eyes and over his blade of a nose, as if pointing directly at his thin lips. He sees you looking, and bird-like muscles flex in his frail jaw. Get a good look, he says, lifting his chin. Or maybe you want to call me some names? I hear eggshell a lot. Or maybe lightning bolt? I get that one from time to two who. I'll just call you the boy who lived. He crosses his bony arms and glares at you. Don't let me stop you. Call me some names. Laugh. Do it, because in a couple minutes, I'll be the ones laughing. Not laughing. I'm sorry if I offended you. Jeez. I don't want your apologies. I... He sighs. You didn't offend me. Believe me, I'm used to this by now. I'm not going to be the butt of everyone's jokes anymore, he says. Electricity sizzles within the nearby parlor. This time, he doesn't flinch away. Lightning flickers, trapped in his, in his determined eyes. I have some money, all right. I'm going to use it to change myself. Change everything I can. He trails off, studying you in turn. His eyes widen, and he glances quickly away, studying the nearby parlor instead. Did you see anyone looting this ruined house over here? No, but I wasn't really watching. He nods at the cultists who are lurking nearby. Maybe they saw something. Oh, are you the person I'm supposed to come talk to? Um, hold on. Uh, what kind of changes are you considering? Why do you care, he says. I'm sure you have business elsewhere in the city. I don't want to be any trouble. Why were you looking at me strangely? His mouth trembles, as though he's wrestling with a question he doesn't want to ask. Doesn't feel good to be stared at, does it? He says at last, looking back at the parlor. He seems to be deflecting your question, although it isn't, your, it isn't clear why. Okay, let me just look at my quest log quick. I'm a little irritated that I can't pull it up. Okay, so... Yeah, we're going to go talk to the Order. Let's see here. Oh, convince Rin to join the party. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, Wayward Son? Yes. He's struggling with a difficult choice. Okay, let's go talk to him again now that we know what we're doing here. So, Mother Tomaz sent me. Oh, he says, blushing. She knows. Of course she knows. That means you know, too. He chews his lip. Fine. I'm scared, all right. I've had this... This ugly face, this body, my whole life. I've saved up to change myself, my future. Maybe I can become strong enough to deal with the people who hurt me. Or maybe I can fix my face. I can do that, but I'll still be small. Despite the anger in his voice, tears are shining at the corners of his eyes. Making a note. I can only use the machines in the parlor once, I understand. It's too expensive. I spent years saving up all this money, and it's not enough to fix me. He opens the pouch to display a moderately impressive collection of coins. And all this money... Tiber glances over just in time to see the eyes to see the pouch open, his eyes bulge. Poor lad, he whispers. All that coin must be weighing him down. We should lighten his load. Hmm. We already asked you questions. Appearance. Strong. Take his money. <laughs> We're not gonna take his money. Do we have any questions to ask? Um I want to know about your past. You already know everything important, he says. He isn't making eye contact. I don't care where I came from, alright? The future is what matters. 
let's see if I can persuade you to chat with me. Let's see here. 75%. That's not bad, actually. 55 by default. 40. 80. Um, let's... Let's use mine to get to 80. I've got a bigger pool. Failure. Crap. R retry. Oh, I'm going to do that. That's never actually come up. Okay, let's try someone else. <laughs> 75. Ooh, success. I'll remember that. Fine, he groans. You asked, remember? He covers his eyes and begins speaking as fast as he can. My parents came to the city with a tribe of people like me. I was born in the underbelly. My first memory is of someone spitting on me. My only friend was a girl named Crooked Queek. Oh, and we had to play in alleys so the normal kids wouldn't hurt us. When I was 12, someone killed my father in a bar, and he wasn't even investigated. He blinks hard, staring at the parlor. So I left, and I haven't seen anyone from the tribe since. Let them live off scraps in the dark. I'd rather die up here than live down there. And she's dead. That sucks. How did you earn your money? A shin at a time, Pico says proudly. I went from shop to shop asking for work. Some of them kicked me out, but others let me sweep once a week or cook. I've done nearly every job, every job in the city at least once. No one ever wanted me to stay, though. They thought I scared customers off. They were probably right. Okay. So... <laughs> Further proof that money is the root of every human being's misery. I'm not going to take his money again. <sighs> Should I tell him about his friend? Yeah, he's going to find out. I went to speak with your friend, Crooked Queek. Someone killed her in recently. Oh, he says softly. He folds his arms over his belly, holding himself. Oh, Queek. Beneath the tears, his eyes are iron. Nothing's changed down there. People kill us, kill them, and nothing happens. I can't ever go back there. It can't be like this anymore. So... Strength or appearance? So here's what I'm thinking. If you stay looking like you can get picked on, even if you can beat the tar out of them, it's just going to keep happening and happening and happening, and people will keep picking fights with you. So I'm going to say change your appearance, because not only does it make you feel good, but you won't look strange, and then um, that'll just open more opportunities to you. So that's what we're going to go with. Making a note. He blinks, startled by the authority in your voice. Then, a smile spreads across his face, so tentatively that it seems to be testing his face to be sure it'll hold the weight. You're right, he says. I hate looking like this. Being bigger wouldn't fix that at all. That's it, he says, nodding. Thank you. You're welcome, dude. Welcome back. This feels even better than I dreamed. <laughs> I assume post-agony. Neat. Well, I feel good about that. Wavered Sun. Alright. So, let's remember to turn that in. Okay, first... Have I looked at every place here? Um, no, this actually... It looks like it keeps going up. That's interesting. Um, Let's talk to these guys quick. Barant. Ayatazi. And Gormo. I can pronounce Barant the best, so let's go talk to him. Not much of a talker, but I like listening. Oh, great. Fidgets. <laughs> I taught. Um. I'm gonna go with Aitsi, something like that. Surprise briefly registers on the cultist's face when she sees you. Then she slightly inclines her head in respect. Greetings, beloved vessel. How may I help you? I think someone looted that ruined house against the cliff. Did you see who it was? Yes, the cultist says. A mischievous expression crosses her face. But I wonder if I can convince you to share something with us in exchange for your help. She ignores the startled looks from her fellow cultists. Will you tell us about your birth? Hmm. Hmm. 
Interesting. Getting really tired of people uh, insisting on trading me. I'm tired of you running your errands. So do I be, well, honestly, um, kind of a dick? Do I tell the truth or do I lie? I'm very mildly curious about what Gabraxi the Erotic Automaton is, but actually, I'm just glad we're not going to get any more details than that. It looks like I could pass both of these pretty easily. It's not... It's not a secret. And I'm sure the cultists... I don't remember if I've told this to the cult already. I'm going to be a little more cagey. Even if it means being a dick. No, my time is more valuable than yours. Now tell me what I need to know. Nah, she says, looking more disappointed than offended. Very well. Updated my journal. We did see someone looking around the rubble before you arrived, she says, glancing toward the pile of rubble. Dirty children, orphans perhaps, were digging through the ruins. I believe they took some food and valuables, but we are trying not to stare. Alright, good day. Okay, so here's my plan. We're gonna go talk to the kids, except it's probably these kids way over here somewhere. Yes, over here. We'll see what they have to say. Um, oh, it could also be... Um, our new sort of friend, Rin. And then I'm going to go turn that quest in. But first, I'm going to take a break, go get a drink, uh, save this so the power doesn't go out again, and then I will see you soon. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.